Hi everybody, Tim Hughes here. I'm the CEO and co-founder of DLA Ignite. With me today I've got uh, Sabine van der Leinden and we're going to talk about is or can insurance be sexy? But before we dig into it, I always ask my guests, where can people find you? So when they find you so um, interesting, insightful, they can go and find you and talk to you further. Yeah. So Sabine, wh where can people find you? Hi, team. Well, people can find me, I guess, mostly on LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn. And my profile is Sabine van der Linden. So I'm the one, the first van der Linden well, the on LinkedIn. Sabine Sabine. On, uh, I'm not the only Sabine van der Linden, funny enough. It's why on some of the social media, because I was not fast enough, like just like TikTok on Instagram, I'm Sabine van der Linden official. <laughs> so so I was, I was checking out your... Um, your LinkedIn profile today. And on your summary title, you call yourself the insure tech queen. Yeah. Wow. That that's so so how do you get to become the insure tech queen? <laughs> so you know I've been in insurance for 25 years. And um, over the course of the past seven years, I've been working mostly in what you would call either the corporate venturing uh, corporate venturing capital funding space, so corporate venturing, really in short, or in the VC space. So I work with a lot of CVCs, a lot of VCs, and therefore a lot of startups. I have scouted over the past seven years over 27,000 startups through uh, my work, yes, with insurance companies, but also non-insurers, right? Financial services companies, insurance companies, and I, I would say adjacent sectors, sectors wanting to get into insurance. And through that process, I have been able to accelerate over 120 startups. I and mean, this morning I had the question as well. So actually now it's probably 120. I mean, it's a lot of startups over seven years and I've helped them raise a lot of funding. So my startup just before COVID reached out to me and said, you know, there's this thing called this InsurTech 100, you know, the most influential, influential InsurTech people out there. And you're the only black female on that list. So why don't you call yourself the InsurTech Queen? Mm. And I felt a little bit arrogant to start with. And no, then... I, 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 no, you shouldn't do. <laughs> and then I got pestered by them so many times. I said, okay, let me do it. And the interesting thing is people are very kind. They love it. It's, it's, so, it's so refreshing, actually. Only once um, I got a message on, on my LinkedIn saying, what? is going on here. I said, you know what? We need to live in a beautiful world and let's have fun. And hopefully the hard work I do every day justify the title. I, I, and and it, I, I think you justify the title. So I, I was interested to see how you um, how you described it. I mean, you, you've got a, um, an amazing background. I mean, for start, I don't think I could make it in insurance. Um, um, I just I just don't think it would be something that I would want to get on with. But you have um, you um, I've got some figures. So to 20, 21,000 I've got written down here and six, six billion. Why have I got six billion written down? Is that what you've is that what you've been able to raise? No, not six billion. So I guess if you have six billion, is uh, the valuations of the startups I was evaluating when I started in InsurTech. So the InsurTech space now is has raised over sixty four billion in funding from investors over the past uh, in twenty fifteen, right? So seven years, and this is. A drop in the ocean when you look at fintech. Fintech has raised so far probably nearly seven hundred billion dollars from investors. So we are only ten percent of that number. And um, as you, as we evaluate uh, ventures which are relevant for our industry, I would say I spend a lot of time evaluating insurance technology startups to what we call insure tech. But what excites me the most is technology vendors, you know, startups which are out of nowhere, interesting in the industry. So imagine uh, cybersecurity, sustainability tech, um, metaverse, uh, NFTs, all these actually are themes which are also in in very interesting and important for our industry. So there are 6,000 startups in InsurTech right now. Every day, my team and I have to probably skin through 2 million startups to actually solve problems for the corporates we are working with. 
it's a it's an amazing um uh industry that 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 has literally come out of nowhere i mean i was interviewing someone on here the other day that um he does cyber security but for um cars um because cars can now be hacked absolutely Um, so um and it's it was a it's a a job and a um uh, and a marketplace that didn't exist five years ago. No, but think about us. We are today doing this podcast with you, Tim. We are using a digital channel, right? We are a remote worker. So anything we do through the internet and through our computers can be act. So imagine anything using digital technology as a potential for cyber risk. And so funny enough, when you think about insurance, this is a big market for us, whether you look at consumer or corporations, they have to look at cybersecurity, surveillance, um, a variety of subconcepts within the cybersecurity space to make their business more resilient, but also enable their customer businesses to be more resilient. And you and I, whilst we are talking to each other, make sure that nothing happened on our computer devices as well. So um, insurance, in, insurance touches everything, doesn't it? Insurance? It's you know I, I'm I'm flying soon into Aberdeen and I have to have travel insurance. There's 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 all kinds of things. You know I get in the car I have to have car insurance. So there's insurance touches does touch so many things, doesn't it? Absolutely. I was at an event in Vienna just uh, a day uh, a day ago and uh, there was a, a very known person from uh, working with the Bank of England sharing some of the numbers and um, one of the stats which were uh, which was mentioned during the event is. Uh, approximately uh, in Europe, insurance represent 10% of GDP. And that is the highest, including life and pension. And, you know, different countries in Europe have these different systems, right? So we also include pension funds, which are uh, held by government uh, agencies. Uh, So it's not insignificant. And whilst it's 10%, I think more can be done. The the challenge with, with insurance is people you know, buy insurance because they have to. And um, the interesting thing is with technology, we're able to make insurance much more interesting for for its buyer by embedding it, for instance, in in other products. So imagine you buy your your laptop, right? You uh, from from Apple, you get this warranty, and if something happened, um, everything is being taken care of. I think we need in insurance to be to that to that point with everything we do, where it's embedded. Recently, I was talking to one of my friends and um, sunglasses. She she bought some sunglasses and she didn't realize there was an embedded insurance into it. And um, she actually were, was going to get them repaired. So, oh, it's covered. Here's a new pair of glasses. And she said wow. she didn't even know that she had bought insurance with her glasses. So that's the world we are getting in where people really understand the value of the products they are buying. I think we probably recognize that nowadays when we buy Apple and we Apple Care is is partly an insurance. It's partly well, you know, the fact a that warranty, it's, but it's a form. it's a warranty that it will be fixed. Yeah. And I can't, I think we kind of probably expect that nowadays. But sunglasses, I wouldn't have I, I'd never thought that there would be insurance embedded in sunglasses. Yeah, and that is very new. It's a it's a new con. I would say it's a new concept. At the same time, it's an old concept. But technology allows it to be uh, straight embedded in a product. It was, I think, a pair of Ray Ban. And so, what you'll find some brands really being keen of retaining their customer, providing a good service, and making sure if you know something happened, they return and buy a new pair of glasses in the future. So, if they have a pair of glasses, they absolutely like why not make sure that they are repair or replace as soon as possible? Now, when you look at replacement, the interesting thing, when you start looking at the market and the changes in market, we need to think about sustainability. So now you also have policies asking you whether they would mind if they have replacement part in the sunglasses rather than getting it all for new. And what you find Gen Z more and more are considering replacement. So what we call circular economy, upcycling, recycling, um, replacing part rather than getting the things from completely new. So there are so many things which touches insurance, which, which is in every, in every, in our everyday life. So, so how can we make, how can we make insurance sexy then? 
So it's interesting because when I started working with startups seven years ago, a few of the insurance, com the insurance companies I was working with said to me, how can we, can we make insurance sexy? Please help us make insurance sexy. And, you know, I teased them. I teased some of them. I said, you know, it would be more than wearing a dress. And so, <laughs> and so how do we do that today is by, for me, looking at the innovation which is out there. We can look at, for example, what Elon Musk is doing, right, with uh, electric, electric vehicles, autonomous driving, and, and satellite. All this stuff needs to be insured. Today, to insure those things, we need to evaluate the risk and use a lot of data. Imagine all the data, which are on Google, Amazon, all this platform can be what well, I can monetize and package to identify the likelihood of exposure of risk then we can actually all the, use this sexy data into the underwriting process, not to do old underwriting, meaning, you know, you get a premium every year and you renew. Actually, you can do real-time pricing. So the technology helps you actually do what we call metered insurance, pay-as-you-go insurance. Okay, pay-as-you-go, yeah. Yeah, and uh, dynamic pricing. Mm -hmm. And then at the back end, when you look at your claims, why not get the claims paid in real time? So you have new business models such as parametric uh, coming to market, parametrics linked to meters. Think about weather. The simplest way to, to think about it is bad weather, you know, drought, too much rain. You get paid if something happened, an event happened. So how do we make insurance sexy is by looking at the innovation which is happening out there and evolving the business model of insurance to make it much more relevant for its customer. The customer become more and more at the root and at the center of the life of the insurance organization, even though it's going to take some time, right? We don't have it right all the time because insurance still remain an inter intermediated market with brokers. Brokers usually own the relationship with the customer. Uh, more and more, what we are seeing is new application of insurance, which are more and more relevant and interesting for their customers. One area I think which is going to grow more and more is the things we are doing to you know, create an economy, uh, providing knowledge to others. We also need insurance. And so yeah. what you find is more and more insurance realize the value of brands and design themselves brands to attract customer in a much more streamlined way. Do you, do you think it's, it's becoming, I mean, you've just explained a whole number of different ways of, of using insurance. Do you think there's one of the things that's come out is this um, innovation? Because insurance, when I grew up, was, it, was the, it was the same thing and had been the same thing for years. Yeah. Um, but now there seems to be this real um, movement in the market, just as well as there is in, in banking. Um, you know, here's a bank account which is different. Yeah. Uh, here's a bank account which is mobile only or something like that. Um, and 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 actually, there's some real innovation going on. And actually, the the sky's the limit. Where there's we've taken the stops out of all of the things that stops us thinking about. No, you can't do that, or that won't work. Or it's long question. But do you think that innovation's taking place? The innovation has to take place. I, I believe there is no choice. So the concept you mentioned, which is in fintech and banking, is called uh, the unbundling of the value chain. So, you know, you take payment out of the traditional yeah. bank and you make it better for the consumer. You know, we all have, you know, Revolut or Starling Bank accounts, which are just managed from our, our mobile device. We know exactly when things happen. I remember being uh, in the meeting in, um, actually it was in Germany, and somebody actually was able to hack into one of my bank accounts. And I got a ping while I was being on a conference call like this. And um, I immediately said, guys, let's just wait. I called starting bank, message starting bank and says, you know, I didn't make this extent. I am actually not in London. I am in Germany. Mm -hmm. And they dealt within within five minutes. Mm -hmm. And so that is what digital allow you to do uh, to actually feel safe uh, we've uh, and trust the the partner, right? The bank or the service provider, which is enabling you to to do your work and to earn your money and to do to have your lifestyle. 
In insurance, the same. We are unbundling some of the processes. And what you find, a lot of the insurtech startups, which are come out there, are trying to improve underwriting or claims or variety of processing. Now, the one which have been doing very well are those who actually really, I think, trying to disrupt the business model. And often, it's not by just looking at insurance. It's looking at the overlap between mobility and insurance, right. climate in insurance home and insurance. So there's this blurred line between what insurance was and will be in the future and other industry and how they join together to fulfill client needs. A good example is a startup called Zigo, which is in mobility. So imagine you order your food uh, on um, Uber Eats or Deliveroo. Well, those drivers coming to bring your food at home have insurance, it can buy metered insurance. Okay, right, okay. Insurance I was, I was actually hour. talking about this the other night. Okay. Yeah, so they buy their insurance by the hour. They don't need to buy a one-year policy. They right. buy it because they are delivering now. So they are triggering their uh, insurance policy as they are doing their delivery or overheat work. And, and that is quite transformational because you are creating safety for a group of workers whilst also enabling them to participate, I guess, in the gig economy or the creator economy in some ways. So what's going to happen in the future? You know, there's, there's lots of talk about NFTs and the metaverse and things like that, digital assets. What, what, how is insurance going to play its part? Insurers are starting evaluating uh, digital assets. So uh, metaverse is one of very interesting space for sure. Uh, I've seen a number of insurers, uh, first from a retention viewpoint on boarding, and you know, talent acquisition is very hard nowadays. So they are going to use virtual reality environments to uh, retain employees and give them uh, an immersive experience to uh, learn. So that is one. I've seen insurers do so doing this with, with their brokers. And actually, there is a wonderful case study for an insurer called Ergo Minicry, uh, which has been leveraging uh, the, the metaverse with Meta and uh, also um, the uh, virtual reality glasses with their brokers to enable them to immerse themselves to understand their customer and how, um, I would say, to sell insurance, but really to understand how to service their customers better. So there is this little angle around metaverse, VR, and really immersing ourselves in understanding the, uh, the customer we are trying to serve. Um, when we look at now being truly in the metaverse, I can see, you know, you can buy now your tennis shoes and try them on, in the metaverse, yeah. right? And so what is the risk, right? If you are making an order, it's not the same. So I can see some new products emerging to create safety in the metaverse. Now, when we sell art with NFTs, we are still working out what is that, you know, safety zone because there's speculation, speculation risk as well um, happening and insurance do not do speculative risk. So there is so much more that can be, we are scratching the surface right now and we are looking at the scenarios and business cases to see how we are going to insure digital asset in the future because we've been used to insure physical asset like buildings, car. Yep. Now a lot of our asset will be digital and they also need insuring. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think there's a big debate, isn't there, about NFTs and about the fact that do, do they um, do they belong to you or, or and how do they belong to you? And 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 while, you know, you can have discussions about blockchain, you know, you can say, well, um, here's a here's, here's, here's a note of money. It has a serial number on it you can't take a photo of it and try using the photo to, to yeah. buy something with it. But um, you could just take a screenshot of it and say, well, I've got it. So there's, there's, a, there's a real debate, isn't there, about, about what's going to happen with NFTs and, and, and how that's going to um, make an impact and, and what's the point of them in, in, a, in a way as well. I think the big question is what is the point of it right now? I think they they have fallen out of love just now. And so hopefully, you know, it's going to go back like any product, right? Product life cycles. I mean, I love the Garner hype cycles, you know, the you know, the drought of disillusion, uh, and then it comes out again. Um we still have to work out the value and how NFTs as part of this Web3 and Metaverse world is going to enable us to uh, to create value 
and a lot of the creators who are into that metaverse world trying to monetize services will want to use for sure crypto and digital uh, currencies to to interact and transact but this is so immature right we started ready matter with the metaverse technically a year ago Sabine, it's been fantastic. It's uh, I, I. It's a subject area that I don't know anything about, and and so I just sit here and soak it up like a sponge because um, it's you know I, I I'm one of these people that loves knowing knowing new things. So actually sitting in front of somebody who knows a whole load of stuff that I don't know, it's just, for me, it's just. Um, I just love it. So thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing your and and, and actually being able to talk to the insure tech queen is has been an honor. <laughs> the pleasure is mine, Tim. I mean, you know, many of us fall what we say, we fall into insurance. I fell into insurance 25 years ago. And I would say the quality of the relationships you build in this industry is magnificent. And so it's very hard to get out of it. I bet. I bet. Thank you so much, Sabine, for coming on. And um, remind people where they can get hold of you. Please connect with me on LinkedIn. You'll find me under Sabine van der Linden. And probably we'll see the pink uh, face. I mean, the pink background in my face. Hopefully you will recognize me. I'm so active on Twitter under Sabine VDL. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, and, and thank you for the, the, the comments as well. So thanks, Sabine. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.